Hi. Hi, Joel. Hi, Ching. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, I wanted to um, thank you to be my guest. And I would like to also thank our um, audience to be there with us today. Um, now, um, let me introduce you to people who are not terribly um, familiar with who Joel Wallet is. All right, I'm going to just read uh, some of Joel's biography. Uh, Joel Wallach composes music for orchestra, chamber ensembles, solo voices, and choruses. Her string quartet, 1995, was the American Composers Alliance nominee for the 1997 Pulitzer Prize in Music. The New York Philharmonic Ensembles premiered her octet from the it's called From the Forest of Chimneys, written to celebrate their 10th anniversary. And the New York Choral Society commissioned her secular oratorio toward a time of renewal for 200 voices and orchestra to commemorate their 35th anniversary season in Carnegie Hall. Joelle also wrote music for ballet um, and other projects. Now, um, let's jump over uh, a little bit about, actually, I'm going to have Joelle Wallach to tell us a little bit about her upbringing. Hi, Joelle. You have a very interesting, um, or I say, background. Not normal, I would say. Yeah. So tell us Nothing a little about me as normal. <laughs> 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 yes. I think there may never be a normal again. <laughs> no. For anyone. Yeah, it would be a bit very difficult. I know. I know. So tell us a little bit about your um, upbringing. Well, although I was born in New York, when I was five, my parents had to go to Morocco and we lived there for about five years. And it was a very beautiful place. But I was the right age to live in a different place because it didn't seem to me like one culture was better than the other or more correct than the other. It just seemed to me different in some ways. And so it made me very interested in an interest that remains in the natural music of various cultures and other things, and the beauty of various cultures. And you can hear that in most of my music, the interest in folkloric elements, the way, um, in many ways, the music reflects natural speech, whatever language I'm, I'm setting. Uh, these are things that are very interesting to me. I'm very interested in the things that seem specific to one person, but are actually experiences that in, with somewhat different permutations belong to all kinds of people and all people. And is, um, how, how was your um, parents, are they musicians? No, they were not musicians, but they were very interested in music. Mm -hmm. And they were very, you know, they gave me lessons which was very important mm -hmm. as you know mm -hmm. right very there's so much it's like learning languages when you're young i know people i know many people of my age mm -hmm. some of them studied music as children and they would like to play an instrument now and they really try but it's really really hard to begin mm -hmm. when you're an older adult but other people who had several years of like piano lessons and then never practiced or played again for the next, what, 40 years or something, they pick it right up again. Mm. So it's such an important thing, I think, for children to have lessons for so many reasons. You know, I'm always disturbed by parents who say, well, that she stopped taking lessons because she wasn't going to be a pianist anyway. Mm. That's not the reason to take lessons. The reason to take lessons is it gives you a wonderful resource for when you're older 
and life gets more complicated, more difficult, more psychological, more challenging, then you have some wonderful resource to fall back on. Mm -hmm. Also, as a child, it teaches you ways to concentrate, to collaborate, to gently work on yourself, to do gentle criticism and incremental improvements. Studying music is a very, very, very valuable thing as right. a child. Right. It, well, you it, know, you you know this, and you have you Ching have not only done it yourself, but you have really brought up another violist. <laughs> <laughs> Your wonderful son Sean. Thank you. I I think uh, learning music, uh, like you said, is not just becoming a player or professional player or people, you know do music as uh, necessarily to earn a living. Music is a lifestyle for me. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if you know music, if you like music, or if you study music, it it brings you uh, a different di dimension. If anything, you are a better art supporter, and you are a, yes. better, you are a better audience, right? And I think that's really true. And yeah. I think also the classical tradition that you and I are trained in, mm -hmm. um, it is in some way an acquired taste. Mm -hmm. But once you acquire it, it speaks to you in such a profound and personal way. And studying music, even for a couple of years privately as a child, when you grow up and you go to a chamber music concert or an orchestra concert, it will speak to you. Well, if you don't study music, you run the risk, it's not always true, but you run the risk of feeling like a stranger. And that never feels good. Whatever kind of performance you're going to, you want to feel included and spoken to in a personal way that music does speak to you. Right. Right. And you, you have the vocabulary to understand, right? Exactly. And also, you open that channel in yourself mm -hmm. so it can speak to you in a, de in a deep place in yourself. Right. Right. So when did you um, start to write music? Because I know you play the violin, you played the bassoon, and you... Played I played a lot of instruments, but yeah. when we came back from Morocco, mm -hmm. when I was about 10, mm -hmm. I had friends and I wanted to play music with them, mm -hmm. but they played all kinds of things where they didn't play things and they knew how to play the kazoo. Mm. So I would have a friend playing the kazoo and a friend playing the recorder and a play friend playing the harp and another one playing the accordion and another one playing the banjo. There's no music written for that. Mm. Mm. So I had to write music. Mm. So always it was about communicating for me, mm. writing music. It was always about bringing people together for a common experience and mm -hmm. to communicate a common experience. Right, right. So there, um, you know, there is a, there's so much changing in technology and, um, so much changing in the presenting also method, right? Like like during the pandemic, you know, now people put music on internet, people play different instruments in their home and making it as a video to do things. Um, back to uh, your compositional method, um, when you write things, do you write on the paper? first and then you transcribe onto computer or do you directly sit in front it's of a computer? It's a great question. It's a great question. I'm someone who edits a lot. I mean, I've written a lot of music which people can see on my website and even here on my website. But of that music, a handful of pieces came like a gift. It's like I sat down one day and there they were. But that's a handful of them. Most of them like grew incrementally from little tiny fragments of something into larger things. And the way that usually works for me, most of the time I'm writing for a particular person or particular group. Mm. And I know the sound of that group. 
and I know what they do best. Mm. And always, I want to write for what they do best because I want to do what sounds best that they do best. Right. So somewhere there's like a particular sound or particular kind of phrase that starts the piece. And I write it down at the piano. I use a felt tip pen at the piano to, to talk to you about the nuts and bolts of it. I have mm -hmm. a felt tip pen, I wrote it on the piano, but right away, I have to write it the way you would use a typewriter mm -hmm. on the computer because my handwriting is so terrible and it goes <laughs> through so many changes <laughs> that I could never figure out what I meant. <laughs> I was so happy to retire ink, to retire pencils. I gave up my electric eraser because really it was practically worn out. I had worn out so many erasures. Yeah. So, and then the next day I print out what I copied onto my computer and I put it on the piano mm -hmm. and I write on that with the felt tip pen. Mm -hmm. And then when it seems like that amount of change is enough for the day or that amount of growth of the piece, mm. I go back to my desk and I put it on my computer. I write it with a notation program on my computer. Mm. And I'm, again, the next day I print that out, yeah. bring it back to the piano and write on it with a felt tip pen. Right. And then this keeps going. Yeah. It keeps going and keeps going. And usually there's a point at which I think, I think this piece is almost done. <laughs> but then every time I put it back on the piano, it has changes. And again, I put it on the computer and write that in and put it back on the piano. It's got endless, endless, endless. And then one day, yeah, I go back to the piano and there's nothing to change anymore. Mm. It isn't even a choice. It's mm. like, I just keep doing it until it's over. Yeah. It's like washing a dirty dish. Yeah. <laughs> just keep washing it until it's totally clean. And you can tell when it's clean. Yeah. 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 And it gets clearer and clearer. And the, the secret is to make it um, technically clear for the players mm -hmm. as much as possible. Yeah. And psychologically clear for the audience. Yeah. So yeah. that it really conveys in a human way what's meant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is a song. Yeah. Can we Should I tell you something about this song a little bit? Yeah. Okay. I want to play our audience uh, your some of your music. So shall we start with the song? Let's start with that song, Assurance. Oh. And let me say something about it first. Tell us, please. Okay. This song is called Assurance. Mm -hmm. And it's based on a poem by William Stafford, who is now a dead poet, but an American poet of our lifetime. Uh -huh. And this is a poem uh, that he wrote yeah. He wrote every morning. Yeah. He would go up to his studio. He lived in the Midwest and he would go up to his studio in the attic of his house. Yeah. And write for a little while. And then he would come down to breakfast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is a poem he wrote for his wife. I'm going to read you the poem. Okay. He wrote this poem. He came down to breakfast. He gave this poem to his wife. And he died right at the oh. breakfast table. And this is what the poem said. This is the last thing he expressed to her. He said, you will never be alone. Mm. You hear too deep a sound when autumn comes. Mm. Yellow streams across the sky and thrums like silence after lightning mm. before it says its name. And so on. It's a song about never being alone. But one of the things I love about music is it can very eloquently say opposite things at the same time, which mm -hmm. one really does in one's heart very often. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, it's saying you will never be alone. It's about being alone. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's an appropriate song for this moment also because all of us are sitting in our houses alone. Mm -hmm. And right. without knowing when this period will end or even what it means to each of us. Mm -hmm. Have you lost a loved one? Do you have somebody you love who might be especially vulnerable right now? It's, mm -hmm. you know, we really, we live in a time of not knowing right. and being very isolated. So that's, this song is, it both has an intimation of that, but it also is a soothing part of that. Great. 
So this is written for tenor and piano. High voice. I've heard it done by sopranos as well. Mm, okay. Okay. Great. So let's see who is the singer. Let's see who is the one. This is a student of mine. Oh, okay. Uh, and yeah. wonderful student. Yes. Mm. You can see. Tenor this. Stefan mm -hmm. Carroll, right? Carol. Stephen Carroll. Yeah, Carol. A wonderful young tenor. Yeah. And pianist is Stephen. Stephen Harlows, who is the wonderful pianist for the Dallas Symphony. Hmm, wonderful. Okay, should I play? No? Okay. Yes, please. Okay. You will never be alone. You will hear so deep a song. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. I wanted that spaciousness in the piano. So he is, the singer really is alone, mm -hmm. almost alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very haunting. And thank but, you. Yeah, but in, in, in the same time, not like a spooky, you know, it's haunting. Yeah. It, it has uh, this longing sound and feeling. It does have a longing yeah. sound. Yeah. And in, in fact, I was very interested in, I'm interested in how painters work. Mm -hmm. Painters mm -hmm. often have like, they get a, a sort of idea, an image, mm -hmm. and they recast it over and over in different paintings. The mm -hmm. same image, but differently seen. And I was very interested in this song in that way. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the string quartet that we talked about also playing, again, casting parts of this melody, which were the first things I wrote with the felt tip pen on the piano, mm -hmm. and casting it differently for string quartet. You can hear it most literally in the third movement of that string quartet, which is very short. Mm -hmm. Would you consider playing only the third movement of that string quartet now? Uh, no, we can play whatever you want to. <laughs> Let's try that one. <laughs> Shall and we? you can see what I mean by I reused it. Okay, great. So let's go find. So I it will take me just a, a, a minute to find. I can chat in the meantime. Yeah, chat. Also, what would you like me to talk about? The stream yard. Of, no, so when you talk online, there's one thing is it's kind of strange like uh, you need to kind of constantly remind yourself you need to look at the camera instead okay. of looking instead at of you 
Yeah, you're, I don't, right. yeah. you're looking at your guest or your your host, and sometimes off, you know. So I have to sort of yes, like, especially since it doesn't mirror image you. Yeah, so that when I see you over there, yeah, it looks like I'm not looking at you. <laughs> you know, very so anyway, so let me find. So tell us what are we gonna hear now? The next one you're gonna hear a string quartet. This string quartet I wrote about three years after my husband died. Oh. And it's not about his death. Oh. It's about how I felt during those three years. Yeah. We want the third movement. Yeah, yeah. I know. So although we could do the whole we could do various movements of it. <laughs> and fun. this movement is related to that song. You yeah. can hear the same kind of longing and the sense of suddenly being alone. Yeah. Okay. But of course, it's it's done a very different way because it's not a piano and a voice. It's four yeah. people playing um, off one another. Yeah, yeah. So who who are these uh, players? These are four more of my students from Texas, mm. and they were um, they were a quartet that was formed for student conductors to practice on. But they were kind enough to play my music. Yeah. Okay. Should I start? This is the third sure. movement. Sure, this is the okay. third movement of the second string quartet. Okay, great. I guess that's the end of the third movement. That's the end of the third movement, yes. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, thank you. Uh, can we show some, uh, so tell us, um, can we show, you have such a wonderful, beautiful um, website. Um, can we show it to our audience? To what? What? I'm your sorry, I didn't understand. Your website. Oh, my website. Yes, yeah. that would be wonderful. Thank uh, you. Okay, um, so let's see, I need to come back to you. And uh, so this is a very, very nice. Um, so so tell us a little bit more about, um, let's see, application. 
website or oh, can't see anything. Website, where is your website? Oh, here your website. Here we go. Okay. So, <laughs> so is this picture taken by the famous Christian? Yes, yes. This is a Christian Steiner photograph. Wow, it's beautiful. beautiful. And also a long time ago. Yeah, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so you have such a clean, clean cut uh, website. I really like. It's very neat and not busy. Very classy. Yes. Yeah. I so, wanted it to match some of the music. Mm, mm. So you have bio and then you have different length of bio, I guess, in there. Let's see. Yeah, biography. So lots of uh, um and then let's see you have grants, uh honors. Award. That's all part of the bio part, but the oh. other big pages are like the works. Yeah. This one mm. is friends or yeah. Um so name a couple of uh, newer ones are 20 2016, 2017 season. You got well, that should have been fixed up more recently. Oh okay. I moved four years ago. Mm. I moved back to the Bronx and the Bronx Arts Council gave me an award as soon wow. as I moved back, which was okay. wonderful. It was uh, the Bronx recognizes its own. And it was a wonderful grant. Wow. Uh, really helped me write a few more pieces and also made me feel completely at home here. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else is more recent? Then I got a very interesting grant yeah. from the um, from Con Ed, the electric company. <laughs> really? And I know, isn't that interesting? But it was a wonderful thing. It was a grant called The Composer in the Metropolis. And with that, Grant, I worked with a completely untrained amateur course. Joel, your and audio. They, hmm? your, your audio is uh, has a little bit uh, funny. My sound. audio is bad. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah, just for a second, has some kind of a sound, strange sound. Now it's okay. Mm. Now, okay. okay. So it was a completely untrained amateur course. It was fascinating. Joelle, maybe you're too close to the microphone or something. Just I'm back not even up. thinking that close. Is this better? Oh. Yeah, a little bit better because it was like okay. a like some punching sound, you know. Oh, maybe it's feedback from my speakers. <laughs> I don't better? know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was too far. Oh. Okay. This was very interesting. It okay. has to be. You're gonna play a. A recording or actually film of the piece I did with them, but not of them doing it. Uh -huh. But they were a delight to work with. And the piece is called When Lost in the Forest. Mm. It's it's about um, stand still, it says. Stand still. The trees around you and the bushes are not lost. Mm. Just stand still, even though you feel lost. Mm -hmm. And it was really wonderful to work with these people because at the end of the grant, after our performance, they gave mm -hmm. me a party. It was Christmas. <laughs> and they gave me a party with <laughs> cupcakes and apple juice. And they each told me their personal experience with the forest. Aww. And But it was very interesting. There was one woman who was a Holocaust survivor. She had yeah. hidden in the forest. There was yeah. another woman, a young woman from Jamaica. And every oh. Saturday, her yeah. father had taken her and her sister into the forest to hide from boys. Oh, I see. And everyone had a completely different experience with the forest. It was so interesting. Yeah. So let, we can hear that piece, but it's being done by uh, four wonderful singers called the Uncommon Music Festival in Sitka, Alaska. Oh. I think you have that clip, I think. Yeah, I do. I do. I want to. I want to play a couple of picture of yours while we're here. You have you ever considered being a model? A model of what? <laughs> <laughs> a model of elegant, elegant. A model of a weird person. Elegancy, yeah. beautiful. 
Oh, thank you. Well, this uh, everything depends on the level of the photographer, and he is really a genius. Yeah, it is. How is he? Do you know? He has left New York and moved to the Berkshires to play the piano. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. You know what? I actually met him, speaking of a Christian Steiner, um, when I'm going back to uh, look for your music, okay, while I'm talking. So when I, um, I for a while worked with a quite famous, famous Chinese pianist, Ying Chen Zhong. Ying Chen Zhong, um, it was a while ago. And so he, I sort of helped him do a lot of things, you know, like, like booking concert in Carnegie Hall, you know, do publicity mm. and whatever it is. So, because his English is uh, limited. So anyway, I'm looking for your quartet. Okay. And then, um, no, no, the singer, singing piece, When Lost in the Forest. And then, so, um, and then one day he called me. He said, he said, um, he said, I'm going to take, you know, take a photo session with a Christian Steiner. You want to go along? <laughs> I said, of course I want to go along. <laughs> I want to see how he shoot, you know. So anyway. All right. So here's that. Should we start from the beginning? Sure, please. It's a short piece. Okay. Oh, here's the poem. Everyone can read it. Oh, yeah. It's a little dark. Oh, oh. no. Nope, it isn't. It's just their credits. <laughs> oh, well. Maybe it won't come up. Okay, hold on. Here we go. When Lost in the Forest. So
What's that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> I have to get out of there. We are here. Hi. Yeah. So anyway. We're back. Yeah, we're back. That's beautiful. How do Thank you, you. How I how do you, how do people define you or or you define yourself in, in terms of musical style? I'm very interested in inner psychological landscapes. I'm very interested in, I'm interested in using a musical language that actually speaks to people mm -hmm. and uses some of the gestures that are those we're already familiar with. Mm -hmm. So that even though the music is new, there's no one who thinks this is about being angry, this piece. Definitely. Or right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it has, um, kind of um, a traditional emotional resonance. resonance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, I would describe it that way. Right, right. So um, I would like to thank um, some of our audiences here and people may, uh, people join us and also some people may, uh, uh, made a comment. And you're welcome to make comments and also you're welcome to ask questions to Joelle or even me. So we have Al. Hi, Al. I was always so nice. Follow my talks, and I really appreciate. Um, and let's see, Isabel. Thank you so much. She said, "Very haunting, Joel. So beautiful. Can you see Joel? Thank you. Yeah. And then I can now see a list of people, but I don't see their yeah. comments. Oh, uh, my friend Tian said sad moving <laughs> also she looks oh, like oh thank you isabel i yeah. now i see them hi thank you people al said you look like an actress that's so <laughs> lovely of you al thank you <laughs> the compliment i guess and then bravo jo joelle L uh, uh, l y i a um, elise elise is a wonderful young composer Oh. who I was lucky enough to have as a student when I was teaching in Texas. Elise is a very gifted young composer. Yeah, and then we have L-Y-I-A, Leia. Lila, Lila is my wonderful neighbor. Oh, hi, Lila. So many people from other parts of my life, how yes. lovely. Oh. So um, now you guys saw no, um, uh, Joelle has this handsome website, so um, and and she also has a has a, uh, a YouTube channel, and you you can uh, watch it and uh, also subscribe it. And I am Jingju. I've been doing this uh, so called talk show, right? I call it a conversation with so and so. I I've done it since uh, March twenty seventh, Joelle. So wow, you did this yeah. almost from the beginning of the lockdown. Yes, I did because because we're here in New York, guys, and we have been locked down for seven months now. I know. At the beginning, I, I it's like I don't know what to do with myself, you know. So I started to Jane, talk. You have found great things to do with yourself. <laughs> you have not lacked really creative and interesting things to do. So I started to talk to my, you know, people and then talk to my family and talk to my teachers. And then that this grew uh, now. Uh, I, I talk to uh, lots of artists, um, politicians. Um, and so it's becoming a very uh, therapeutic uh, thing for me. It also reconnect me with you, Joelle, because we we used to uh, make music. Like we did make music together. Yeah. We were also neighbors for a while. You wrote trio for my string trio. I Jake. wrote a trio for you. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I wrote on the Chinese folk song. Do you still remember that thing? Is a I remember it very yeah. clearly. And the Chinese yeah. folk song yeah, is such an integral part of it that it's part of the printed music. Yeah, it goes like. And whenever I listen to a recording of it, I also listen to a recording of you singing it. Yeah, it goes like. 
人人那个又说，一梦山那个好。Don't let me go on. Anyway, uh, it's a very wonderful book. <laughs> so, uh, so, so the whole point is、uh, to reconnect with friends, families, and artists, and promoting my artist friends, and by talking to them, and I learn from each one of you, and、uh, listen to your music, listen to your artwork, listen to you know what you have to say. I also、uh, talk to people who、uh, authors write write you know books and. And designers, interior designers, and all kind of things. So anyway,、um, so I do this now、uh, every Wednesday. Yeah, I used to do two shows a, a, a month. Now I want to focus on, on just Wednesday because I am editing a film. I will become more busy, so so I just do Wednesday. Yeah. Anyway, so please, please, if you can subscribe my YouTube channel, Jewel Media. <laughs> so it's like a big deal for me.、Uh, oh yeah, another another really good news, Joel is、What? it just happened two days ago.、Uh, I'm officially a、uh, YouTube partner now.、Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot of work for me.、Uh, first of all. Uh, to apply, it means、uh, some of the video you make, YouTube will put ad on it. Every time people watch your、uh, video, if they, you know, go through the ad, if you just skip the ad, you don't get anything. If you go through the ad, then maybe you make one penny. You know, I don't know, <laughs> one penny. So I don't know. I think to me is not just about money. It is more a. The status, you know, and so and、I、it's an outreach. Yeah, it's a bigger outreach. It's I don't know. It's just called monetizing. You, my videos are being. <laughs> That's a blunt so, way for them to put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but whether you can make you know ten dollars a month or three dollars a month, you know, who knows, you know. But 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 it's a validation of your work. To me, you know, because I have to sacrifice a lot of videos. I have to get rid of them because it has、uh, copyright claim issues. So,、mm. in other words, I play Shostakovich sonata, viola sonata myself. That is an issue. I have to get rid of that.、Mm. So, I, yeah, because Shostakovich is uh, was uh, uh, Shostakovich died nineteen seventy five. So it's not seventy five years yet. So it's a copyright thing. So I have to be very careful. Even when I do my other composers' works, if their recording is label, you know, generated recording, and then YouTube will give me a notice, say, you know, copyright. So then I have to take it off. Even after I use the, their music, talk about them, then I have to take it off. So, so I have、um, to be very, very careful. Yeah, about about all of these. But overall,、yes. but anyway. So let's talk about you.、Uh, what else should we play? You have wait. Let's see. We have string quartet. We have the rest should, of the string quartet. So let me、that? tell you a little bit about the string quartet. And remember, I wrote it in the aftermath of my husband's death. Yeah.、So、the first movement. Each movement is about a different kind of response. I had to the first movement. Has a lot of the four players. They they sort of soar around in pairs,、mm. and then after a while, the viola is all alone. This string quartet in general features the viola because I think it's the least diva-like of the strings, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> except for Ching. <laughs> except for Ching, <laughs> usually. No, we are. We're, and, and we're, easygoing. we're very easygoing people, violist. Well, you don't have like the wild drama of the high notes of the violin、right. and this brooding thing in the bottom of the cello. Right. Did you have this even in between thing, beautiful melodies? But、right. it's also the most introspective in that way.、Mm -hmm. It's not a dramatic instrument as much as an introspective instrument. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things that's interesting to me about writing large and medium and tiny size groups,、mm -hmm. like when I write for orchestras,、mm -hmm. I'm very interested in having part of it 
for the orchestra is very powerful when everybody's playing together. Mm -hmm. But that's like a big public thing. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. speak like like speaking in a big conference or a lecture hall. Mm -hmm. And then chamber music or small numbers of instruments is like an intimate thing among friends. Mm -hmm. And when yeah. there's only one instrument, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like thinking to yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And so this soaring kind of thing in the first movement of the string quartet sort of tapers down mm. to like only the viola thinking about this alone. <laughs> so that's what this is about this first movement. And we're going to hear the second half of the first movement because it's too okay. the whole story. Yeah. So well, let's find uh, the point. It's it two minutes, I think. Right, right, right. right. Two minutes. Let's go about 158. That's the end of that movement. Beautiful. Do you oh, thank you. Shall we play another one? Yes, the second movement. Remember, this whole quartet with its four sections, its four movements, is about different ways I felt in the aftermath of my husband's death. So this second movement that we're about to hear is about just being very frustrated and angry that this whole thing happened. So here it goes. Yeah, um, before we play this, um, is it OK? that um why is this thing here is that okay if you tell us like if what is it okay is it okay to tell us uh a little bit about your husband who passed away like how why well, he died of the treatment for his lymphoma he died of radiation sickness from his uh, cancer i see i see Wow. Was he a musician? No, he was a scholar. And he studied ancient languages from the Middle East. Oh my God. Wow. And he's a But he was also like my parents and very dedicated amateur musician. And he's American? Yes, he's an American. He oh. was an American. Okay. Wow. Well, I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you. I don't, um, 
can. This is the angry movement. In case you think I only write soft, <laughs> slow things, <laughs> it just yeah. happens that way on this program at this time. Melody is some angry music. Oh, okay. I can't hear what you just said. I said, let's hear some angry music. Okay, okay. okay. Third movement. Oh, second movement. No, yeah, second movement, right? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Um, who um, who was your compositional idol when you were learning, and then now you're a mature artist yourself? Who are you still, uh, you know, look up? Uh, whether it's modern person or classical person. In other words, who are your compositional idols? I think always Bach, always mm -hmm. Brahms, mm -hmm. um, and and you know so many. It's very hard to pick one. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. If I had to pick one or two, they would be those. Um, I think there are things I do that are like them. I think Al asked a question, but I can't read it because there's like a little help uh, balloon in front of his question. Al, what is your question? Can you see his question? Whose question? Al in the chat. Oh, Al said, Al said, what do you mean by movement? L oh, like movements. That's a great question, Al. Yes. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> Usually, this is long, long ago. Like in the time of Bach, they would write things that they called sweets. It would be a series of dance movements, but they weren't meant exactly for dancing to. They were meant for listening to. Mm -hmm. And they had contrasting fast and slow and fast and slow and fast and slow and gradually they became codified into other kinds of music into symphonies and string quartets and they became individual sections that are related to each other in the piece but are separated it's like in a book of short stories there are sometimes stories that are related to each other but could exist separately. But when you see the character in one of the stories, you realize, oh, I knew that person from earlier in the book. So the movements are sections, but they're, each section has a little beginning and an end in itself. But the larger framework of the piece is meant to hear them one after another in a particular order. And this piece is like that. 
you heard the third movement before. It's the one about being very lonely and isolated. I don't know if Ching wants to play that one again or move right on. Because again, Al's question is so germane. It's the piece really has an arc. It goes through that first section of hardly hardly being used to being alone and then to being angry and then to feeling really alone. Mm -hmm. And then the last movement I haven't talked to you about yet. But I will. <laughs> <laughs> really what do you think King? should we play the third movement again sure sure and I, 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 I have another question before we play sure. is that um, you know the, the modern day um, creativity writers composers right mm -hmm. uh, yes. and whoever is doing their work and uh, and people protect that very, very well. You have copyright, and, but in 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 old times, in Baroque time, even before that, in Renaissance time, and when composer writes something or when composer learning something, and it is okay for them to copy somebody else's work. So or their own. yes, you can yes. still copy your own because you own the copyright. But if you don't own the copyright, you can't. So, so what do you think about uh, and why and composer would... Copyrights if, only became really standardized in the early 20th century. And in fact, it was funny for American music because in the United States in like the early, the first decade, part of the first decade of the 20th century, you could just play any European music you wanted. So there was no need for Americans to say songs. Suddenly there was a, an international copyright law and all the publishers that were reprinting European music had to find a new music. And suddenly the beginning of the 20th century, you see a lot of American music beginning, whether it's Irving Berlin or it's, you know what I mean? So that worked very well to protect play, uh, composers until streaming and Spotify and so on. Now it's very hard to control. And it's very hard to be heard because we don't have publishers backing that stuff up. Now, even before copyright laws, like in the time of Beethoven, Beethoven is later than say Bach. Let me tell you about Bach first, because Ching is absolutely right. Like most of most of the Bach harpsichord concertos are adaptations of the Vivaldi violin concertos. Almost all of them. He wasn't stealing. <laughs> it was just the way people worked then. It was a common thing. And it was, they learned from one another. They really did learn from one another. And there's a sweetness to this. By the time of Beethoven, a lot of this stuff, even though there wasn't yet, this was in the beginning of the 19th century, even though there wasn't yet a powerful international copyright law, there were powerful publishers. And the publishers would then kind of own the piece. And some of them did interesting things with them. Like for example, there was a relatively obscure European composer called Diabelli, who wrote some, sort of theatrical pieces that were very popular. So Beethoven's publisher commissioned like 15 composers to write little variations on this one thing in Belly Belly. So Beethoven said, okay, I'll do it too. But then he got so interested in writing variations of this melody that he wrote 31 of them and it became a piece all by itself. Again, it's appropriation, but it's not stealing. It's also what happens to you when you study music. One of the things that happens is you, when you play and you study people's music, you mm -hmm. become very absorbed in how they thought. Mm -hmm. It's a very special way of thinking. And right. Ching, you're such a serious performer, you know, and you've seen it develop in your son too. <laughs> you become really, you go into the world of that person. So mm -hmm. thinking about that music and making um, embroidery on it right. is a kind of very special communion. Right. You know, music is, in a funny way, it's its own religion. Yeah. It's very, very 
intimate connection with your forebears in the past, which is why when you ask me who are my favorite composers or who, I can mention one or two, but the truth yeah. is there are so many that I worship. Dvorak, right. you know, so many Bartok, yeah. you know, yeah. from different times, Copeland in a completely different way. I like, heard you mentioned I heard, Shostakovich. Yeah. Hmm? I heard a little bit uh, like the Ravel or Debussy in your... Yes, Ravel even more than Debussy for me. There's something about the ways he uses the colors of instruments. Mm -hmm. He uses instruments not only in such a sonorous way, mm -hmm. but he has such an almost tactile interest in how it feels to make sounds on them mm -hmm. and how it feels for instrumentalists to play together, like the Ravel String Quartet is full of that kind of thing in the piano right. trio. Right. Um, so, so we're going to listen to third movement. And this is the one about really feeling suddenly terribly alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, third movement. So you can see why I'm interested in this. this mm -hmm. Although this grew out of a very personal and specific experience of mine, mm -hmm. I feel that everyone experiences that kind of loneliness and bereavement. Mm -hmm. And so it, you know, it's a communic. It's not just about me. Mm -hmm. It's about us. Right. It's about an experience that humans have. I want to respond to Al. First of all, Al, since you asked that question about my being an actress, <laughs> I think I might have to adopt you. <laughs> You're just wonderful. So I never thought of an, I would love a career in the entertainment business. It would be really fun. I did used to do a lot of talking about music mm -hmm. for various orchestras, and I really love doing that. Mm -hmm. Because it feels to me, well, Shing is doing this in a, on a different level in, by doing these films, but it feels to me like inviting people into a place that's like home to me and that's very mm -hmm. meaningful. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So it's very comfortable for me to talk about music because it's so it's like talking about your home. Right. You know? And Joelle, tell us about um, your experience of being a pre-concert talker at the New York Philharmonic. Well, that was wonderful. I loved that job. And part of it was this thing of inviting people in, but part of it was also, it was like a puzzle to make these talks up because the audience was uh, basically only two kinds of people came to those talks. People who knew the piece, had every recording that had ever been made of the piece, owned six different scores of the piece and knew everything. <laughs> and then there were the people who came to the talks who had never been to a classical concert before, you know, and they didn't know anything about it, but they were really, they were curious enough to come early and skip dinner and to listen to something about it. So the trick for me, and I love this trick, was to talk to these, this audience of people, of the, both of these kinds of people, and give the people, let the people who didn't know about it feel welcome and realize that in fact, because as you can see, you, you understand the feelings in music. Mm -hmm. As soon as the door opens to you, as soon as you don't feel intimidated, and it's a strange classical thing you don't know anything about, as soon as you don't feel like that, it enters into your soul. Mm. But you have to not feel like a stranger. You have to feel like a guest, like a welcome guest. And so part of the lecture was always, and it was seamless, you couldn't tell which part was which, what, that was my goal, mm -hmm. is to make the people who are basically uninitiated into this, but curious, mm -hmm. to make them feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And then to make the people who are really experts, mm -hmm. to give them something they hadn't thought about before in the piece. Yeah. And it was really fun to do this. And of course, I think this is from my own personal standpoint. I think it's most interesting to do that from a composer standpoint, mm -hmm. because composing, composing is such a personal thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're really expressing something very deep inside you mm -hmm. that you believe is shared with other people, with the players and with the audience. And so it was very important to me to do those talks and it was also very fun to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's wonderful. So let me tell you about this third, the last movement, this fourth movement oh, of this piece. Yeah. Okay, last move. Okay. Now, okay. this is a special experience I had mm -hmm. after my husband's death. Mm -hmm. When he died, mm -hmm. now you might not have noticed this, but you might have noticed this during this talk. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm funny. I don't mm -hmm. mean odd, although that's true also. But mm -hmm. sometimes I'm funny, haha, -ha, not funny, peculiar, not just funny, peculiar. Mm -hmm. Mm. And, but when he died, mm. for years, for like two and a half years, mm. nothing seemed funny to me. Absolutely nothing. I never laughed. I never made a joke. I didn't think anything was funny. Mm. Mm. And then about three years after he died, almost mm. three years after, mm. I gave a lecture in Chicago. Mm. And all of a sudden, I was funny. <laughs> All of a sudden, I was funny. And while I gave this talk, I kept thinking, oh my God, I'm being funny. It was amazing. And starting then, I would have like little outbursts of like my old self. But mostly with other people. Remember what I said about when I write for groups like the string quartet? Mm -hmm. It's like being with a group of people. But mm -hmm. as you hear in this last movement, mm -hmm. after a lot of this going back and forth and funniness, the mm -hmm. viola, remember that instrument mm -hmm. that we talked about before, is very, very personal, introspective instrument, mm -hmm. like Ching, mm -hmm. like Sean, her son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that instrument is alone. And mm -hmm. you hear it take the same material mm -hmm. that was funny, that was like a joke, when it was played with the other instruments, you hear it distill and slow down and very introspective. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, everybody gets back together again and it's almost, it's not quite funny, but it's communal. Mm. So that's the fourth movement. Okay, great. Let's go. <laughs> ¶¶ 
And that is the end. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And thank you for doing this, Ching. It's been a pleasure getting to work with you again after such yeah. a long time. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you for talking with me. And I always learn so much from you. And you're such a great teacher. Thank um, you. It's been a joy to do it. Yeah. Presence. We kind of are running late. Should we still do the odd? Oh, did, I, did we talk about to do a rapid rapid fire? 
like quick question, quick answer? Should we do sure. it? Sure. Okay. So, because, uh, uh, yeah. So, in the end of my in the end of my talk with my guests, I usually do a rapid fire. Uh, it's just a fun thing. Uh, so I ask uh, some questions, um, some question maybe kind of dumb, and then you you answer quickly. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> you answer dumbly. <laughs> so all right, never know quick all right. Enough. yeah, that's it. Favorite color? Hmm? What is your favorite color? Yellow. Three things in your refrigerator at all times. Brie. <laughs> Always brie. <laughs> Almond milk. <laughs> oh, so healthy. And cat food. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're a cat person. Um, oh, yes. So so tell me, tell me a couple of things why you like cat. I like them because they're very responsive, but in a very subtle way. They're like music. You have to learn how to listen. <laughs> awesome. If you win lottery tomorrow, what's the first thing you're going to do? If I what tomorrow? If you win lottery. Tomorrow? Mm -hmm. If I win the lottery tomorrow, I would do two things. I would hire as many musicians as I know and have a and record lots of great music, including mine. And the second thing I would do is I'd buy a big piece of land and have a cat sanctuary. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. <laughs> I'm a cat person too. I have two cats. Um, oh, I didn't know that. When yeah. I knew you, you had a hamster. Yeah, well, yeah, that was a short. <laughs> I didn't go long. You graduated up the evolutionary yeah. scale. Yeah, yeah, we always, we always had cat. We actually, we always have. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I have two now. At one time, I had a four. So. Oh um, my. Yeah. All right. So, what is? Uh, are you a mountain person or are you a water person? You know, some people love water, like ocean. Some people love mountains. I'm what mostly a mountain water person, like lakes. Mm, lakes, your lakes. So it's like <laughs> mountains and water. <laughs> yeah. No, I said mountain or water. You know? <laughs> no, no, unfair to people who like lakes and mountains. <laughs> you have to avoid people like that, like us with that question. Uh, yeah, fancy, fancy, fancy. You like both. All right. So, like um, if you are, if you are not a musician, what would you be? I think if I could start over, I would become, I forgot whether it's, it's some, I think some sort of per, a botanist who studied trees. Mm. I wow. love trees. Wow. Interesting. I should show you a book. Uh, my Wonderful. friend, uh, my friend is a photographer. He publishes, the, he has seven book published. This book is, it's all about tree. Yeah. Wonderful. I'd love to know that. Yeah, he's Italian. Yeah. Well, I'll show you next time I see you. All right. So what else? Uh language you want to learn a uh, master other than English? Spanish. Even mm -hmm. though it's supposedly one of the easier languages for English speakers to master, I want to be able to go out in the street and speak to a Spanish speaking person and have them think that I was born speaking that language. <laughs> Wonderful. Where would you like to live? other than New York City? I would like to go back to Morocco. I would like to return there. Mm, nice. Last question, coffee or tea? Depends on the time of day. <laughs> <laughs> Both, but not mixed up. That's funny. Oh, wow, <laughs> wonderful. So it's been a great pleasure. <clears throat> to talk to you to well and it's been a delight Shane. Thank yeah you. yeah and uh really wonderful. yeah so sorry for all the technical problems and uh yeah so we're gonna end this now and then everybody thank you for watching and uh watch us next uh what do i who do i do next wednesday um let me see next wednesday Oh, oh, I am interviewing Kevin, another composer, conductor. Um, he, uh, yeah, um, 
Kevin Scott. I don't know if you know him. He he lives in Bronx. Yeah. And he then, lives in the Bronx too? Yeah, he lives in Bronx. Yeah. Yeah. And we're the new Brooklyn up here. Yeah, he's like a, he's a conductor for many regional little orchestras here and there. Yeah. Oh. And then I'm gonna uh interview Jay um Julio, only 24 years old. A, he is um violinist but he's all uh activist 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 um and then after that on the 30th september i'm interviewing um nicole and and sari who is a uh, actress actress really good actress yeah anyway so next month i interview some com uh, also can uh, what do you call composers i i i've been talking to a lot of composers so wonderful all right, thank you so much, Joel. And then maybe we should get together when you know the thing is a little bit you when know. people are allowed to get together. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We can wear a mask, you know. <laughs> I would love it. I would love it, Shay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so, so much. It's I'm been a joy. Gonna, yeah, so so wonderful. And then I'm gonna end the broadcast. And Joel, you hold on one second, okay, before you click. Okay. I'm gonna end with our audience. Bye, guys, and be safe and be happy. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for listening Thank you. and your wonderful comments and questions. Yes. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you.